Okay, I'm hoping there'll be a more detailed screencast to come, but since time is short and this week is busy, I wanted to at least show y'all a PowerPoint that covers the basics of protein synthesis, which is getting from a segment of DNA called a gene, that when you express that gene, you get a trait, and that trait comes from the protein that is made. So we're going from the gene to the protein, and the way we do that is through something called the central dogma of genetics, and this was beat into my head. It is the guiding principle of genetics, and that is that DNA makes RNA, and RNA makes a protein. So from DNA, you can make a copy of one of the strands that is RNA. Note the different colored backbone to symbolize ribose over deoxyribose is the sugar, and we've got uracils now instead of thymine, but that strand is a complement to the strand that was copied, and from that RNA, you're going to make a protein, which is three-dimensional, and it has domains and active sites and a tertiary structure. And that happens over two steps, and those two steps are transcription, which is here, and translation, which is the RNA to protein step there. In this process, there are many actors. I'm going to talk about RNA as the actors. There's three main types we'll talk about, but in the table you can see that there's a whole bunch of other RNA actors doing jobs here. And so those are mRNA for messenger RNA, tRNA for transfer RNA, and rRNA for ribosomal RNA. You should already be familiar with ribosomes and what they do, but we'll get into more specifics now. Messenger RNA is the copy made from the DNA of the gene that will move from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And transfer RNA is going to be the piece of RNA that is made to carry a specific amino acid to a sequence on the mRNA strand so that it drops off all the amino acids in the correct order so that you make the same correct protein every single time. Transcription is the step that I just went over where DNA is copied into RNA. It's called transcription because literally it's just writing a copy of those nucleotide letters. So there's a lot that goes into starting transcription, which I'll talk about in more detail later, but the whole purpose of this is to produce something that can leave the safety of the nucleus so that the information leaves but the DNA stays safely inside in that nucleoplasm environment, safe from all the enzymes that would be in the cytoplasm. So this is basically how transcription works. There is a set of signals, all molecular, that bind to a region called the promoter region, and when they are assembled in just the right formation, that turns the gene on, and that segment can begin to be unwound. RNA polymerase will come in, Okay, let's try this again, this time with the right PowerPoint. So we had the promoter region of the DNA, transcription factors, which are proteins, came and bound to that promoter region, essentially turning on the gene, meaning that it attracts an RNA polymerase to come and unwind that segment of DNA so that it can pair up RNA nucleotides with one of those strands. Again, these RNA nucleotides are built in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction with new nucleotides being added to the 3' prime end. But as they're added, they're not going to stay stuck to the DNA for long. The DNA, the other DNA strand, is going to come back in and bind, and the RNA is going to peel off or peel away, and it will actually go through something called RNA processing, before it moves out for translation. But that's going to have to come in another screencast because it is not a part of this PowerPoint. So you can practice transcribing the DNA into RNA. It should be pretty simple. Just make sure you use uracil anywhere you feel inclined to use thymine. That's how you pair up. So there's still adenine, there's still cytosine, there's still guanine. They still pair up with the things they normally pair up with but uracil will pair to DNA's adenine. There's a few things that I'd like you to know about translation. First of all, it's universal. It's amazing. All life uses the same code to make proteins with amino acids. That blows my mind. Every codon 
On an mRNA, if you start, it's called the reading frame. So you start at the start codon, and every three codons after that, sorry, had to pause quickly there, there was an announcement. Every codon is three nucleotides. So you start at the reading frame, mRNA has a start codon that is AUG. After that, every three nucleotides in that established reading frame is a codon. And every codon will specify an amino acid. But there is a wobble effect. Some of these amino acids can be dropped off at multiple codons. So the codons can be redundant. So just to give you a little graphic sense of what I was talking about, you can see the three nucleotides there, the codon, the anticodon is going to be the complementary three nucleotides exposed on the tRNA. tRNA is actually a big folded RNA molecule, but it has three little RNA nucleotide prongs off at the end that will bind to the codon, and those three are called the anticodon. And every tRNA, when it is charged or activated is going to be carrying an amino acid. It's going to drop those amino acids off, so tRNAs also come in an uncharged form. Charts like this are the ones you're going to use to read the genetic code. Uh, the box is more typical, where you have the first position on the left, the second letter on the top, and the third letter on the right, and so matching those up left, top, and right, you can find the codon you're looking for, the three-letter sequence. Many people like the circle better, but it is not as common, but you start in the center and move outward, but it makes it really easy to see some of those redundant codons, like GG. As long as you start with GG, it doesn't matter if you end with G or A or C or U, you're going to code for glycine. And so here again is an incredibly oversimplified view of translation, but you have an mRNA attaching to a ribosome that happens at the start codon, which I did not illustrate here, but that start codon is AUG. And so the start codon's tRNA would come in and bind, dropping off a methionine. Then the ribosome is going to move, or the mRNA is going to move through the ribosome, and another tRNA can come in and bind. That is going to initiate a peptide bond forming between the two amino acids, and it moves to the most recent tRNA that has come in. And so watching this again, you can see that another, the old empty or uncharged tRNA falls off, a new tRNA moves in, and then the strand will move towards the most recent tRNA. That's going to continue until you reach a stop codon. You should know the three stop codons by heart, and that's where released factors, which is just another protein, but when they come in and bind, they're going to break the amino acid chain from the last tRNA, and everything's going to fall apart. The ribosome will release the mRNA, the tRNA will release the amino acid, and the release factor will fall back into the cytoplasm. So, key points I hope you didn't miss, that for every codon you have a matching anticodon, which means you have a matching amino acid, which means that you will be able to drop off amino acids in a specific order. That means that every protein created from a specific messenger RNA sequence should be the exact same protein because all those little amino acids have different chemical properties and they are going to affect how that protein folds together. Every gene will create at least one unique protein, but we'll go on to talk about later how that can be spliced up and you can actually have certain domains of the protein kept in one version of the protein but others in another and so we can actually get many proteins from a gene, but for every gene you're going to get at least one protein. So to check your knowledge, and this may not be perfect, the blanks may be a little bit off, but you can try to fill in this graphic organizer. So again, more details to come later, but so that you have something to watch tonight, there is your very quick uh, DNA protein synthesis 
Screencast.